over 40,000 people that stood at the entrance to Arlington National Cemetery as the memorial was being dedicated. Fast forward to today, in just a couple of months, we'll celebrate the 25th anniversary of the same memorial that honors the three million women that have served and helped to defend this nation, even when it was not legal for us to be part of the military. I'm going to show you a short video that still chokes me up, so after it plays, be patient with me because I'll need a second to, uh, to recover. But in this video, you will see the little general that could. Brigadier General Wilma Vaught. She is the founder of the memorial and president emeritus. And when she retired from the United States Air Force in 1985 as a one-star general, because of her time in grade, time in rank, she was the senior ranking woman, not just in the Air Force, in the entire Department of Defense. One month ago today, she was at the White House for the President to award her America's highest award to civilians, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Wow. That's <laughs> so without further ado, let's um, enjoy this video. Now, this was in 1997. I say that because we had two women that were there to serve in World War I. Yes, World War I. And she will have a little line, you'll see her, she'll have this little round hat up there. Her son walked her to the podium. She was 102 years old. And when her son walked her up, he was a retired Navy captain, and he was 81 years old. <laughs> And she talks about, and pay attention to the line after she says, when I served in the Navy, women, what? We got off the metro site, and oh my God, I looked to my left down toward the memorial, and it was just a sea of people. And you couldn't find an empty place all the way out of the Lincoln Memorial. We're not a servant in the Navy. Women were not even allowed to vote. There were tens upon tens of thousands of people all helping to give recognition to the immensity of what this memorial was and will be. We are here today at Arlington Cemetery before this beautiful memorial on sacred ground to honor and pay tribute to the generations of American women who have served and are serving in our nation's armed forces. It was so powerful and there was nothing else to do but cry. Thank you. America knows what you do and what you have done. Maybe it hasn't always been recognized in the past, but today we proclaim loudly and clearly. We recognize it, we're grateful for it, we say God bless you, and we will always thank you for helping to make our country what it is. Well, I was sitting on the base, and one of the things I had planned was for the military to bring the flags in states and territories down that aisle. And I have talked to some of the people who were carrying those flags, and they said it was one of the most unforgettable moments of their life because people were reaching out and touching those flags. It meant so much to them. I am Captain Linda Bray. I stand for the women who served in Granada, Panama, and the Gulf War. It was overwhelming. It was a feeling of pride. It was a feeling of camaraderie to see so many women in one place. 
and to have them still wearing their hats or maybe their ribbons on their suit. That's one of the things I encourage them to do is that you can't wear your uniform. Wear whatever part of it fits. <laughs>
Uh, World War I happened, such a shortage of people in the military, and there was never going to be enough, that somebody in the Pentagon was reading through all of the policies and laws, and all of them said that in order for you to join the military in the 19 teens, 1915, 16, 17 era, you must be a man and a citizen of the United States, except the Navy Reserve. It simply said you must be a citizen. So the Chief of Naval Operations made a judgment call and said, let's enlist women into the Navy Reserve, and if we need to activate them, they can then, and over 10,000 women, they lined up city blocks as soon as they knew they could enlist into the Navy, like the lady that said, I served in the Navy when women couldn't even vote. But because of that, we will argue that on Capitol Hill, that was really the tipping point that gave women the right to vote. Because the standard story up on the Hill back in the day was that because we did not exercise all of the requirements of being a full citizen of the United States, i.e., you did not serve in the military, but there were laws on the books that said women could not serve in the military. But wait a minute, I can't vote because I won't serve in the military, but you're telling me. So because of that, um, women, about 13,000 women served in World War I. The sea services, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Navy. The one branch of service at that point that did not permit women to serve was the Army. But we found a way, ultimately. Now, Congress was not happy about this idea of women and the loophole. So they quickly acted on Capitol Hill and changed the, the law so that, once again, even in the Navy Reserve, you must be a man and a citizen to serve. It was not again then until the 1940s with World War II that they started saying, we are going to have to bring more women in. And their first calculations, fuzzy math, on the back of an envelope, I guess, they figured 86,000 women would be needed to serve in uniform in World War II. In fact, over 400,000 women served in uniform, and that doesn't count all of the extra, the Red Cross, the USO, all of the other ancillary services that were out there supporting and doing things because we were capped at how many women could join. And then in June 12th of 1948, only 74 years ago, Harry Truman signed the Women's Armed Service Integration Act. Yes, a big deal for us. <laughs> Before this was signed, women could serve for the duration of a war plus six months, and then thank you very much, ma'am, go home. This now gave us the opportunity to serve for a career with major stipulations. We could not exceed 2% of the military. This was in 48, and in 57, nearly a decade later, when General Vaught joined the Air Force, they were less than 1% of women in the Air Force. And she recalls being on a major installation overseas, and it was three women nurses and herself were the only females in uniform that were on a major installation overseas. So it took a while to change. Of course, in that era as well, if you got pregnant, you were instantly, you were discharged. So I don't know if you noticed in the dedication video, we talked about where whatever could fit. Well, the lady in the helmet liner, that is actually the mother to the design architect that helped to design the memorial. We did a national opportunity for people to submit their renderings of what they felt the memorial should look like. The mom to Michael and Freddie said, you're an architect, you're gonna help design this, and not only are you gonna help design and submit for the content competition, you better win it because I had to get out of the army because of you. Because <laughs> with Marion Weiss. They were two people from different uh, architecture firms that came together because General Vaught, in her staunchness, said there must be a senior woman on every part of this construction, from the design to the construction.
construction company to all the subcontractors. There must be a senior woman. So Marion White joined arms with Michael Manfredi, and they're happily married now to this day. So we brought them together. We continue to tell these stories, and, and we highlight from 97. Who could have guessed that in less than four years after we dedicated 9-11 would happen? And all of the changes this nation has seen, the wounds we have all borne. Like I said, I have four of my sons that are combat veterans. I've spent time in Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm a proud member of the DAV because it was DAV VSO. So a gentleman in near Fort Rucker, Alabama, that as I was transitioning out, he sat me down and he said, you're going to do this. I said, no, nah, I'm pretty good. I'm fine. Nope. Start at the top of my head and we went down. And I stand in front of you as 100% service connected. <laughs> And we've got to stop letting that mindset languish across our communities. And that's what I love about the DAV is that you guys reach out and you have that hand up mentality. You know, I, I had no idea at the time, but as we went down the list, like, yeah, I, yeah, it hurts. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. But as we go down, you know, as, as, as we get older, who knows what happens? Uh, with the conditions. I have one condition in particular that I wanted to share with you, and that has to do with why I'm so excited that they pushed the signature of the signing of the White House till Wednesday, because I intend to, I've been invited to stand there and to sign the PACT Act on Wednesday. <laughs> But, you know, I've got sons, I have friends, and I visit some of my men and women colleagues at Arlington National Cemetery. I pop a top for them. I know what beer they drink. I'm not a beer drinker, but I'll pop it. I'll take one sip, and then the rest of it goes on the grass at their, at their great mark. And I think it's important that we tell them how we're doing, too, what we continue to do to make a difference in the veteran community. But as I go there and I have the opportunity to stand and witness what the PACT Act does, it affected me directly. I have an autoimmune situation where my body is attacking my own liver. And in the 1980s, this situation was the number one leading cause of liver transplantations and also the leading cause of death. Thank God, the medications that we now have available to us um, will slow it down enough that I should have a normal lifespan. So I'm fortunate for that. But I would really have never known had I not met the right people at DAV. So when I had the opportunity to join and become a life member, well, of course, that's a no-brainer. And I'm happy to stand here in front of you healthy, as healthy as can be, taking advantage of the Veterans Affairs uh, medical care that I think is world class. And I'll tell you as a registered nurse, and I do have access now based on position to talk with Secretary McDonough and let him know. And I, I normally love to champion the good news stories. I got COVID in May of this year. First time, double vaccinated, double boosted, shouldn't have gotten it, but it did. The VA Medical Center, as soon as they knew I was COVID positive, in less than four hours, I had five different physicians' offices calling me, my endocrinologist, my liver physician, my primary, down the line, to make sure, I, one, I knew I had COVID, and two, then the pharmacist called to find out, did I want to take any kind of medication? My brother died at the age of 59 this January from COVID. It's no joke. I said, yes, I want something. What, what are my options? I could either get in, infusion or oral medication. So I opted with the Paxlovid. Let me tell you what the VA did. They gave me, the pharmacist gave me her phone number. And she said, can you be here before 2 p.m. today? Absolutely. She says, call me when you're five minutes from the front door. And we all sent somebody, it looked like they were in a hazmat suit. Mop four, here we go. <laughs> 
front of them. I pull up, I put my driver's front window down, I show my ID card, they confirm it says Phyllis Wilson on my driver's license. They drop this bag on my passenger front seat and they turn and they walk away. I drive home and I start taking the medication as soon as I got home. Had almost no ill effects whatsoever. But that's what your VA is now doing. want you to know, at least for me and the DA, VA Medical Center, um, and I, I'm confident the people that look at that, they have no idea who I am from, from Jane Smith, anybody else in, in their system. I don't get a special tag beside my name, I promise you. So that's what I'm seeing happening in the VA, and I'm so pleased, and I continue to receive all of my care through them, although I do keep my TRICARE for just in case. But for the VA, and what we're doing with women's health and women's clinics, I think it's stunning. And it feels like a really great way for us to connect all of our women veterans in. So I'm gonna close by just simply, we are in the midst of, we're a 501c3, I have to tell you that too. We do raise money in order to tell these incredible stories of women past, present, and into the future. One of the American women currently serving in the Marine Corps the helicopter pilot is most likely, Jasmine will most likely be the first woman on the face of the moon. That's a U.S. Army. Tell the story, certainly not just of, of amazing women like Dr. Mary Walker of the Civil War, not like Deborah Sampson of the Revolutionary War, not like incredible generations of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and let's talk about those Cold War veterans, shall we? Amen. That's amazing. That's the peace dividend. You guys were probably the best generation because nobody wanted to tangle with the United States during the Cold War era, and we would leave you alone. So I'm really pleased, and we have a special part where we talk about the Cold War generation and the men and women that wore the uniform because you are a veteran, whether you were in a combat zone or not, we're very proud of every one of you. So I have a short one minute video that again, hopefully gets your, your red blood pumping and please God, let it work. <laughs>
Sure, so we do have ambassadors in every state. Uh, Shannon is, is one from New York. Louisiana, Puerto Rico. Louisiana, Puerto Rico. Louisiana, Puerto Rico, yeah, we got them in the house. <laughs> you guys are getting here as well. So one of the things that we have is like a big baseball card story of amazing everyone that has ever served or is serving. You don't have to wait till you're out to put your story into our national database. of so 302,000 women's stories now, but there should be 3 million stories in there. And I am certain there are a number of you in here that you have not yet even begun to tell your story. So we do have a table set up. Shannon has been manning the, the table. Carmen from Puerto Rico. Um, so do reach out or go to the website womensmemorial.org up in the top right how you can create an account. And men in the room, you can create an account too. Anybody that has capacity to get onto the website, please create an account. We have 275,000 friends of the memorial that have an account because then once you're in there, you can search to see is your mom, your grandmother, your aunt, your niece, your daughter, your wife, is her story in our database? And if it isn't, and she's still alive, please encourage her to tell it in first person. If she's no longer living, tag, you're it. Tell her story as best you can. Don't let her story be left out. Researchers look at our database, and they're looking at the change over time of what women are able and capable of doing and what legally we're permitted to do. Now, every career field is open, but very few of the women that have served in the last 25 years have their stories on our database. Almost all of those 302,000 that are in there are the women that served before we ever opened our doors. So if researchers are looking, there's no way for them to tell that times are changing. Yes, we still have work to do, but you're standing on shoulders of incredible American patriots that are no longer living, and it's on you to make sure that their stories have the impact and the power that shows that what they did made a difference for each of you. And the same applies for the men in the room. Please, you know somebody that has served or is serving. I got a lot of dads that will register, create an account, and register their daughter, and they purposely put in a really bad picture of the girl. <laughs> Smart, they know what they're doing, because they know she'll get in there and, and update it, right? So it's, it's all online now, you can do that, but you have to create an account to get into the database. And then when you get in, challenge you, go in and look up names like Julia Child, Marilyn Monroe, you name them, they're probably in our database. Julia Child served in World War II in the OSS. Marilyn Monroe was a USO woman that was in a combat zone, and that's the criteria for that we also served. So she's got her, her Department of Defense ID card, and we have a photo of that. Uh, so it's, it's incredible who you can find. But the stories that are stunning, this one woman was born in the 1920s when her British parents were vacationing in the United States. And she was born on U.S. soil, which made her an American citizen. But she grew up in England. World War II hit. Shortly before D-Day, they were advertising, basically they knew there were some women in Britain that could join the American Women's Army Corps. 45 women that this woman knew, they all joined up together, and her story is stunning of what she did. She went to Omaha Beach, D-Day, and because she was a good singer, just before they took off from England to get to D-Day, they asked her to, can anybody sing? So they lifted her up bodily over the heads of sailors and soldiers to the top of the ship, she sang everything from Chattanooga Choo Choo to Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy, you name it, she sang it. And in her story, her most memorable experience is seeing the joy on the faces as people were doing a little jitterbug, a little dance, and singing along. And she said she knew, even before they left, that while some of them enjoyed it, it would be the last time for years they'd have something enjoyable, but also for some, it was the last singing they'd ever hear. And it's meant a lot to her. These are the stories. If you need a good pick-me-up, 
get yourself an account, and if nothing else, go in uh, over there where it says find a service woman, type in any old name. You're going to find, out of 302,000, you should find somebody that has that last name, and just start reading them. And it, it should empower you to make sure that if you know a woman veteran or you are one yourself, keep adding in. Add your second service, your third service, what you're doing now in the DAV, what you're doing with other organizations. Keep adding to it. Tammy Duckworth is in there. Lost both her legs in Iraq. Served then with the VA in the state of Illinois. Became a congresswoman from Illinois and now is a senator. Her story, we keep updating that with her and her team. It's important because I believe we are lifetime servants to this nation. If you have given yourself, raised that right hand and swore that oath, I think it's just part of our DNA for the rest of our lives. So I hope that sort of answered what you need to do. Get to the desk, get to our counter. We've got brochures that explain the information and a lot of ways that you can help support us to tell those stories and to safeguard all of the artifacts and diaries and journals that these women sent to us. Just ma'am. Correct. If you're having any kind of an event in your state, you can always reach back to our homepage and say, we'd love to have one of the state ambassadors, or we can get a representative there if you need a speaker. You know, we'll get somebody to you to help explain this. And I'm so glad to see that we have been in the room. This is not a women's only topic. We need to make sure, and you know, we're American veterans, and we're proud of it. And it shouldn't be done in a silo. So continue to tell that story, be proud, and, and register their, their date. I need them as pick-me-ups every day to keep me challenged to do what I do. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. We're hijacking the conversation here. I just wanted to share something with you. It's, it's a happy story. So I'm a hospice nurse. I train. I work. I've done a lot of nursing, but um, the last thing I did was hospice before I went overseas and got blown up. But anyhow, there was a World War II nurse that um, she wasn't even a nurse, she was a code, code breaker, and she worked for the Navy. She's a wave. And she was very elderly, and, and I took care of her. And what really impressed me, and I get emotional, is she told me her story. And she said, I didn't do anything different. The um, MPs escorted us every day. We were embarrassed by ourselves. And they took us to this building with no windows. And we all broke roads with Germany. You know, went ahead and um, interpreted everything they said. We gave it to them so that they would be able to know what the enemy was thinking and doing. And she said, and she did that for like five years or four years, whatever it was. And she was young. She was in her 20s. And she spoke fluent German and English. And, um, but she said she did nothing different. She just did her duty. And it gets me to today because she was so humble. And, um, and it was just, it was nothing to her. And I told her before she had passed away. I thanked her and I said, don't you ever think that what you did was insignificant? Because she told me, well, I didn't get blown up, you know, I didn't lose legs and arms like the guys did and Norman did. And I said, no, but if you didn't do what you did, there would have been a heck of a lot more guys dying than Norman did. So thank you for everything you did. And um, I don't think her story ever got told because she told me that three or four days before she passed away. I wish she had, but she was so humble and didn't think it was significant at all. And um, if it wasn't for women doing that kind of stuff in World War II, they were used as human computers. And those human computers and people like her, co-breakers, made a huge difference. And um, I respect her now, even in a graveside. I'm just like, wow, well, you go, women.
We have to stop doing that to ourselves. American deserves to know what an American veteran looks like. And we all look at us. We are all so different. We're every shade, every ethnicity, everything. And that's what I'm so proud of, is to see and be able to tell these stories. So challenge accepted. Please make sure that these stories are told. Get to the table here or go to womensmemorial.org and take the time. Get it started at least and then we'll continue to carry the water for you. Our ambassadors have been doing yeoman's work of getting especially our deceased women veterans stories into the database. But we can't register and history will not recall what is not told. So we've got to get it in there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing that story. You shared uh, her voice. That was really very, very touching. I'd now like to introduce Jennifer Dean from the VA Million Veterans Program. You may have seen that they're here on site uh, during the convention. MVP is the National Genomic Research Program to learn how genes, lifestyle, and military exposure affect the health and illness. Veterans who partner with MVP contribute to improving the lives of fellow veterans and ultimately everyone. Jennifer, I know you want to talk to this group specifically for a couple of reasons. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. I just feel like you're always a hard act to follow. Um, but I think you touched on some things that are really important to us with the Million Veteran Program. I see lots of familiar faces in the room, and I know lots of you are already familiar with our program or members of it. Um, so, for those who aren't that familiar, you already got an overview. We are looking at genetics and health and lifestyle and military experiences. And the diversity within that cohort is the most important thing for us to be able to make sure that the medicine that we're delivering at the VA is representative of all of you. The whole goal of this is to really bring personalized medicine to the, the bedside. So, how do we treat an individual as an individual when you guys are getting care? Traditionally in research, um, women are underrepresented, as well as minorities. I know, it's shocking, right? <laughs> and so we're trying to change that within our program. To date, we are just 200 veterans shy of enrolling our 900,000, um, and out of that, about 9% are women. So that means 86 to 87,000 women are in our cohort already. Our women tend to be younger and more diverse than the cohort of men, which means that we can actually do some really amazing research looking at that group. So we're looking to expand our portfolio in women's health over the course of the next several years um, and really start to build that up. So we're asking for your help in reaching out to more women veterans to help us to make sure that we are all represented within this program. It's going to impact your care for years to come and those of generations behind you. You guys are leaving a legacy for, for future generations, um, as well as doing yourselves um, a benefit by helping us to really provide evidence-based medicine to you guys in healthcare. So we launched a women's campaign back in March of 2021, um, and since then we've enrolled 10,000 new women into the program. We have materials and information that you can share, um, or we can ask that you talk to another veteran and let them know about this program. Um, and just share our website with them. They can learn more at mdp.va.gov. And to date, we have over 40 projects that are ongoing and are expanding to 75 plus by the end of the year. Um, and we are doing research in areas like PTSD, um, suicide risk, uh, breast cancer risk, and are having a lot of really incredible findings come out of this. So why does this matter, right? If we can understand the biological basis of these diseases, we can find better ways of screening individuals so that we can do earlier interventions, or tailoring therapeutics to an individual, again, based upon you as an individual person. So some of the research that's come out today has looked at suicide risk, and we have been able to identify 30 pathways that can now be used to start looking at um, identifying additional risk factors and new avenues for treatments and therapeutics for individuals who are at higher risk of development of having suicidal um, ideation. We also looked at some COVID-19, during COVID-19, right, everybody pivoted to try to understand what was going on, and the VA is doing a ton of work looking at long COVID and looking at 
the impacts of this um, on our veteran population is so incredibly important. And so one of the things that MP was able to contribute to that was looking at um, our, the cohort of African Americans. So we have over 150,000 individuals of African ancestry in the program. It is the largest cohort of its kind in the world, um, as well as we have the, probably the largest cohort of women in any program like this in the world. And so we were able to identify that individuals um, who have specific genetic risk, genetic variants, are at higher risk of developing severe kidney disease. So what does that tell us? That tells us that in these individuals, we really need to be screening for this and treating them differently and making sure we're looking out for those things so we can prevent severe, severe illness in those individuals. And finally, for women veterans, we are looking at breast cancer risk and testing screening tools that are used in the private sector to see whether or not they can apply to you in, in, within the VA. And we have actually found that yes, these tools do work well within our female population. However, we were really only test, able to test it in our European ancestry population. While we do have large numbers, we still need to increase that diversity so that we can make sure that these things are tailored to each one of you individually. So, we're going to be launching a mental health cohort um, as part of the Scott Hannon Mental Health Care Improvement Act that you guys helped pass. Um, and are going to be enlisting 50,000 new veterans to really focus in on some of those severe mental health conditions um, and substance use conditions. So stay tuned for some of that coming out in the future. Um, and we are, again, just looking for, for your help in spreading the word. Um, consider joining the program. Come to us with any questions. And really would love to hear from you and hear your feedback on how we're doing and what you guys would like to see from our program in the future. This is not just our program. It's your program. You have made this possible. Um, we always joke that if there is a, a gene for service, we will find it in our veterans. Um, if you guys have come out and, and really stepped up and are leaving again this amazing, incredible legacy that's going to, to go on into the future for decades and decades to come. So I will leave it at that. Um, if you guys have questions, you're interested in sharing information or need some information from us, please reach out um, to either at our, our call center. You can go to mvp.va.gov. Our call center number is there. Um, or you can reach out to, to me personally. I'm at the table until about 5 today, so I'll have business cards out there. Um, but I appreciate every single one of you who has uh, joined our program today, who has talked to us about it, or who has come to us with your concerns. And really look forward to reaching that million milestone and, and beyond and starting to increase our portfolio of research, um, not only in women's health, but in military exposures as the fact that moves forward as well. So, yes, so that's important. So, if you are interested in enrolling, um, enrollment includes going through an informed consent process where you sign a consent and have authorization to give permission to access health records. That allows us to track your health over time. Um, and you donate a small tube of blood. You can do this enrollment either at a local facility, there's about 70 VAs across the country that have staff there, or you can enroll online and we actually have a, a, a way of collecting a, a specimen that we send a kit to your house. Um, so that we can really reach additional populations that don't use the VAs or that it's a really long drive for you guys to get there. So you can select that option and have that kit mailed to your house. When your information is used for research, the researchers do not get any identifying information. Um, so we protect your privacy um, as best we can. All of the information that's published on it is published on a group of individuals and no one is, is directly identified. Um, so we, we are doing everything we can to protect privacy and security. Um, and I know a lot of folks have concerns about your benefits. No information goes into your health records about um, your participation in the program. It is used for research purposes, not for clinical decision-making purposes. Um, so it is not something that's going to directly impact your benefits in any way, shape, or form. Thank you.
Women Veterans Committee Advisors in their department. So as our guest panelists, if they'll make their way to the stage, I'm just going to give a little brief uh, overview of the panel discussion now that we'll have. Many of you have been, I think, asking for this in, in terms of the Women Veterans Seminar uh, because probably the most uh, frequent question we get asked is, or a call that comes up um, to me might say, you know, I've been appointed as a Women Veterans Committee um, chairperson, and I don't know where to start. And I say, well, did you ask your commander appointed you, and, and what did they say? And usually I'll get the feedback. They don't, they didn't know. They didn't told me, I'm not sure. Uh, do whatever you want to do. So I know a lot of you have been in that same situation, and the four women that are here have had some of those same experiences and been in that same uh, situation at first. And so I thought it would be a great idea for you to hear from them directly um, about what challenges they faced in their department for setting up a Women Veterans Committee for looking at uh, what kind of outreach, staff, um, outreach strategies could be employed to attract women veterans to come to the meetings, um, what resources they use to develop a strong network of women in their community, and then finally to share some tips with you um, how to get started and to be successful as well. So I want to get, uh, we'll start with um, having each of the panelists introduce themselves, and if you're pleased to share your name, um, the department you're affiliated with, and when you served in the military. And Kim, we will start with you. I'm Kim. I'm
And currently my position as Department of State Commander, we have a, a, a fairly decent women involvement. Most of the, the chapters have their own thing going. We have a massive uh, fishing event with um, our women's group. Uh, we also partner with some of the, commu the local community college and universities with the Veteran Oasis, and we try to get to partner with um, the National Guard and Reserve, especially those who are deployed, and just kind of help them out with talking more about benefits and services and supports in your community. And then we have uh, a fairly decent connection with some of the senior centers and senior homes. And um, I, ha I have to say I am very blessed with the Department of Connecticut. A lot of our, our past commanders were very involved. I have not, um, I haven't called on anyone in our department that hasn't been willing to help or run something, drive, you know, drive to pick up someone. So I, I have to be grateful. I'm very thankful for Connecticut State. We have a really good networking team. Uh, hi, my name is Katina Barnes. I'm from the I started out as the, uh, my department, uh, Women's Committee Chair, and then I was moved up to the state. I served for four years as the uh, Women's Committee Chair, and um, now I'm on the committee with uh, Nicole as our state chair. I inherited my position from a committee that existed in the Department of Tennessee. Uh, I think we were pretty dormant, but we've kind of stepped back in. Was supposed to go. 
But kudos to Tennessee, even though we didn't know what we were supposed to do, the sentence after they said we were going to appoint Valerie to be that person was, let us know if we need any funds, if we need to budget money for your program. So one thing I would, um, I think you can learn from this, which I've talked to a number of you over the years about, is if you do have the opportunity and you're appointed to one of these positions, it's really important to develop, you know, an agenda, um, to write out some of the goals, what you'd like to achieve, and to, you know, if you have meetings, to keep minutes uh, of those meetings, to keep the contact sheet for the next person. As we know, these positions, just like the Interim Women Veterans Committee, it is up to the, the commander, the national commander, to make those appointments so that people can change, and it's the same at the department level or at the chapter level. As you bring in new, you know, another chapter of commander or department commander, they may say, we'd like to give so-and-so an opportunity. And if, as you can hear, at some locations, it's really difficult if you're just starting from square one, you know, rather than saying, okay, here's, you know, what, what I've done and what, what came before me, and certainly, you know, you can then build on that foundation. Um, is it important, let me ask this, did you find that it was important to reach out, for example, to your VA contacts, your yes. women veterans program manager or MST coordinator or others? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, for me, I started out in my chapter as a women's committee chair. Um, it was really important to me because I didn't uh, see a voice for women in my chapter, but I was given the opportunity to organize events um, it was whatever I wanted to do that I felt the veterans could benefit from. So I just started thinking about things that I would personally enjoy learning about or was important to me. Um, then I then created a contact with the, the VA clinic for women at the uh, Baltimore clinic. And I started asking them about things they felt were the veterans needed to know or what they felt was important for um, me to share with other women veterans. So that's how for us we had our first event, which was military sexual trauma and um, PTSD. Um, and it was really important because at that time, even though it was talked about, there was not a lot of information or resources out there for veterans to go to or utilize. And then we then learned that it wasn't just women veterans that suffered from MST, but also men as well. And men are, um, there are more men that suffer from MST than there are actually women veterans. So, even though it's a subject that uh, we hear a lot about, there are people that are still suffering from it. Um, so then once I started uh, making connections with the VA, I started reaching out to other organizations. Um, I started reaching out to the veterans and the DAV that wanted to participate on the, the committee to see what they wanted to do as well. So we just started building from there. So I was given a clean slate with a very small budget. I was okay with the budget because I understood how to I was able to ask, I knew how to ask for money from the, the chapters so that I could fund the, uh, the, the events that I wanted to host and we went from there. Yeah, for us, in Connecticut, connecting with our VA program manager was the key for us. And uh, then branching out. So we have a quarterly town hall at the women's clinic, and we do it by either Zoom or uh, social media. Um, so we meet quarterly and you know find out what. But our main focus was wraparound services and preventing homelessness uh, or housing issues. So it could be whether it's rental issues. It could be. Uh, because during COVID, people couldn't work, there was issues with childcare, and so those are things that we focused on at, at our center. Um, and the, our, our, the women's director and the women's clinic was really, really supportive. And then we reached out to other service as well, because we have a large population of American Legion, so we reached out to them to see what were they doing and how we can partner with them. And many of them end up becoming DAV members, which is great. But um, but I think the challenge for us, for me, and I find it kind of we're so spread out. So like from where I am to some of the other chapters, it could be a two-hour drive. So having in-person events can be challenging. So uh, my focus lately is just to connect with 
the, the states in this summer, so a lot of states are not having meetings during the summer months. So it's really connected to, to see what's going on in those states and have meetings with, um, because of the state commander, is starting to put together meetings with the service officers and just the officers in, in, in the department to find out what are the challenges and what are the, what supports the women need in their chapter. And, you know, go back again to VA, um, the, the, the VA program director and see what we can get from there. One of the things that we did that was really successful was a um, baby shower. So we started doing baby showers again and to also get some of the spouses um, to, to join and support. But the challenge for me mostly is because we're so spread out is to get people in the same place at the same time. We had three challenges that are at the top of my list. Um, the first one is where are the women? Where are all the women that are in our state? Where are all the women that are in the DAV? And that was challenge number one. Uh, one way we overcame that is we had a membership list printed and we found all the females and we sent them all postcard. We didn't get a huge response, but we did get some of the response and that's how we got people invited to our first event that we did. And from there, it keeps growing. Um, the next challenge, one that we'll continue to work on as we grow, is how then do we make those women feel comfortable and how do we find out what their needs are? Because as much as we want to grow and do, we basically have to be guided by our group that we're serving. So um, we have several women that we're working with outside of the community that are not members, but they're on the outside, not comfortable coming in, either because of an MST experience or um, maybe they're going through a claim right now or you know something that's triggering that they don't want to come into the DAV. So we're finding ways to do things with them outside of there and then our goal is to survey them and find out what is it you want to do, what are your strengths, your weaknesses, what are you interested in when it comes to serving veterans and continue to build programs from there. Um, our third challenge was as we're doing this, how do we widen our nets? And the way that we're doing that is a lot of collaboration in the community. There are so many service organizations and veterans organizations in our area. And um, we had the Santa Up Women Veterans that we did last March. There were, I mean, booths everywhere. There were almost more booths than there were participants. And everybody loved it. The resources we connected them to, um, the resources that connected to each other. That was a really great thing, and having that resource fair available with the event was amazing. Lots of partners, lots of collaboration, and hopefully that keeps on going and keep on going. Thanks. Manager. When anybody calls me, that's one of the first things they say for a resource. 
you know, you need to build your list, go in there and meet with that Women Veteran Program Manager. They're your source to lots of information, lots of resources within the VA. If you have a homeless veteran, a, a woman that's homeless that has their kids with them that needs um, immediate housing, um, someone, you know, the, with substance use disorder or mental health problems, um, they are going to put you in contact with everybody so that if you have, you know, a specific, someone with a specific problem, you've got a number to call right away to get that person to someone that can help them. So I think, you know, that should be number one on your list. And I think it's great when they're willing to meet, and you hear that oftentimes, they're willing to meet um, with, the, with, with you and then have, you know, quarterly meetings or a phone call or a Zoom meeting update you about what's happening at the facility level as well. They might be having certain programs or a certain, um, you know, day that they're doing something special for women veterans. And you certainly want to be um, aware of that so you can push out that messaging. A part of what you're saying, Joy, with uh, the relationship we built by starting with the visit, as a result of that relationship, we now have a quarterly meeting available to us with the medical center director and all of the hospitals in Tennessee. Additionally, uh, each hospital is mandated by their central office to do two uh, town hall meetings a year for female veterans and four forums. And we are uh, active participants in every forum because they want us to have an opportunity to, to glean issues that are being discussed to see the other female veterans so that we can increase our population. And that has worked really, really well. And that's a, a great uh, contact to have because if you see something at your facility where it's not a welcoming, safe environment, um, you should be contacting the facility director immediately and your women veterans program manager so that you know they're responsible to make sure um, that change is immediate. So building that contact list and them knowing you and taking your call is important. Um, and that means showing up, you know, getting to meet them. Um, I wanted to ask about um, a couple of you told me, and it seemed to be a theme um, as we were talking about what um, about the summer today, about opening it up and being family friendly um, and, and, and including children. Um, in some of your events and things. Could some of you talk about that and why it was important? Um, at the uh, Stand Up Women's event that we did last March, sorry, <laughs> child care um, was a big part of it. I know for myself, I have four kids, and it was hard for me to even come be a part of the DAV when I first got involved because my husband had to work and I had to be at the meetings. I'm very lucky. I have an amazing chapter. We have tons of support from everyone, especially the men in our chapter, for all of us women. And I would bring my kids to meetings. And having that open was the only reason I'm sitting in front of you today. If they wouldn't have offered that and been open to that, I wouldn't be sitting here. Um, it also got to expose my children to it as well, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, but when we did this women's event, one of the main things that we needed to do was to have child care. Um, personally, two of the veterans that I brought in, one of them had five children, one of them had four. They both had very young children. And so for them to be able to leave for an entire day, sometimes it just wasn't possible. So having that option available for those who need it can bring in a lot of extra female vets. And maybe some of them don't need it, but that was a really critical thing for us to have. I know for us, what I see is actually a need for that because we don't, we have, I haven't done uh, a lot of events with family members, but one of the things that we talked about is creating uh, auxiliary women because that's where some of our supports can come from, can come from. So I haven't started that yet, but it's in the works, it's, it's beyond the thought process right about now, but that I see is a great support to have, um, to bring people out who don't have child care and don't have other supports or maybe have a spouse at home who, who's ill and they can't come so have other people come with them because a lot of times veteran events are mostly for veterans 
So if we open it up so that they can bring maybe an older a, a child or a sibling or a grandchild, someone who's at home that's a part of the caregiving process, bring them with them, we can have more people and more participation. Very inclusive, I like that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if any of you have done anything like where um, the kids are part of, um, let's say, a program where the, the, um, their moms are talking about their military experience. As we know, oftentimes women veterans just don't talk about that or they don't you know, share it routinely with their family, but almost like, you know, um, with, so they hear directly from their moms some of the interesting and maybe sharing pictures uh, with them when they were in the military. Well, we have a women's fishing trip, and I bring my grandchildren. I have five grandchildren, so I'm able to bring four, because the three of them normally come with me. And even my mom came with me, and it was just amazing. They, you know, they feel, sometimes they're like, oh, we didn't know that. Like, well, you're not supposed to know. <laughs> but it was amazing, because they see, especially when they're younger, uh, my, my oldest grand is, is almost 11, so he's understand a little more. So it's, it's, it's an amazing experience to watch them glee over with, you know, what we're doing together. What about community resources? Have any of you used um, contact and community uh, organizations to, you know, donate items or to uh, partner somehow with you to support women veterans? Okay, so, and I'm not bragging right now, just letting you know. <laughs> so I do, we reached out to Cosmetics, which is an organization, it's an online cosmetic company, and they donated $75,000 worth of facial cleansing products, so that was an amazing thing. Um, and we were able to not just share with the women veterans, we were able to share with staff. So a couple of things we have our hospital volunteer uh, personnel that help us out. We were able to donate to women veterans who work night shifts. Um, so we will bring the, 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 the products out up to the hospital or to a volunteer, and they will distribute to the night shift because oftentimes you have a lot of women that are women veterans who are staff at the VA, and because they work nights, they never get to come out in the daytime and see what's going on. So I want to make sure we include those as well. And uh, so that's one of our, our major partners. We have, and also with the, the College Oasis. That's another group that we reached out to. And in Connecticut, a lot of our issue is housing issue. So we are able to connect with the homeless team of the hospital. And some of, a lot of the women that are in the homeless program, some have an OTA, or they're not in the service group because obviously they're homeless are facing housing issues. So we're able to connect with the housing, um, the homeless team at the hospital, and which kind of lead us right into um, BJO, those who are coming out of incarceration. And we're able to meet with them and find out what supports and services they need. And sometimes it's just getting a couple of women together and saying, hey, you know, can we look at our closets to see what we need, what we have, and we may need someone that's Maybe a 3x, you know, we have a lot of, because when you go to uh, like Goodwill, you don't find stuff for women that are taller and larger women. It's, it's easier to find something that's a smaller size. So we're able to, to just knock that off the park and just partner with some of those groups. And it ends up being membership sometimes, but our goal really is to just connect women to services and give them some support so that they can get back to that quality of life they deserve. That's great. I mean, when she told us uh, about that, we were all like, wow. I mean, just from a call or reaching out for cosmetics, just... Um... And then there are so many companies online that you don't think about, but even when we're doing events, I will go to Costco or BJ's and have my DAE letter, you know, or something, and they will give us maybe a couple packs of stuff. With the Veteran Oasis, we'll give um, snacks at the college, at the, um, and they will call and ask questions, because I'm, I give them one day, so I said contact me on Thursdays, because I can't be open, like, 
So on Thursday, I'll get about 13, between 13 and 20 phone calls from student veterans who are just looking for support and services, either connected to mental health or need other support. So it's, you know, it's just another way to, to get women support. And can you talk about, um, we had a stand up for women veterans wellness retreat in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And, um, if you guys have been up on your reading from the g &E magazine, it was featured in there in the last um, issue. And if you could tell us a little bit about that, because that was just, it looked really awesome. Um, one of the things we started with was a really, really great speaker. Um, having that keynote speaker to share her story, I was busy for a lot of it, helping my friends with their nine kids who were throwing food everywhere um, for part of her speech. But um, a great keynote speaker, we had our NSO there. We also had um, a female CSO there in case anybody wanted to file a claim. Um, we had breakout sessions, we had uh, a lunch all together, um, we had uh, Native American female group come in and bring in our colors and share some of their story and their culture with us. Um, we collaborated with, I should have mentioned earlier when I talked about the child care, the way we got child care was to work with um, the Southeast Technical College in our, in our town and their child development group is who came in and did child care for us at no cost. So if you have a local college that has a child um, development program, they might be willing to help you, and especially if you're active at the colleges, bringing them things, and that's a way for them to get back to. It's all about the connections we found. Um, yeah, and we had food and snacks, and, and mm -hmm. the two sessions was pretty great. And you had a couple of other ideas that you shared. Um, one I thought was a great idea was to go to a gun range. Oh, talking about in the future or having a self-defense class and asking maybe the local police department or someone who would be experienced to, to host that. Yeah, so um, our VA Medical Center has done several women's events in the past and I couldn't go because it was during the work day or in the um, hours that just didn't fit with, with my kids. But they would do things like knitting, flower arranging, which some of us like, that's fine. Um, but a lot of us, we want to do things like, let's go to a gun range. Let's go shoot the guns. Let's learn some self-defense. And as we age or as our disabilities get worse, that's another concern that we have. So having that self-defense course, being able to do things that remind us we're not just women, we're warriors, and we always will be. So that was a huge, huge thing we're trying to figure out. Great. And I know a couple of you, um, I think Valerie, you indicated you hosted an ice cream social and uh, doubled your participation at the next meeting. Just again, a, quick, a small snack getting donated. And again, it doesn't, you know, not all chapters or departments may be able to have, provide funding, but you know, there's simple things you can do too with your time. So visiting a woman veteran that might be hospitalized that has no other family. Um, or an elderly veteran who really needs someone to read for her um, because her macular degeneration is bad. Or um, I know um, one of you, oh, uh, Juliet, can visit Walter Reed patients and bring um, uh, comfort packets to women veterans, right? Yeah, so since uh, 2014, we, uh, Chapter 13 uh, started up Operation Gift Card and we've had a lot of women participation. So over the years, we noticed that the wounded warrior transition battalion has, of course, there's more and more women getting out because more and more women are serving. So we are able to uh, specialize uh, welcome home packages for women. So we, are, we visit Walter Reed once a month, drive from Connecticut with the supports of LVAP, and from Connecticut to, uh, to Walter Reed and now uh, Fort Belfort Military Hospital, and we're able to create, to, to bring, you know, bring a packet and we also fundraise through local community, local services, and we're bringing um, Avery's gift cards. So we're bringing down about $5,000 worth of $20 gift cards. So each, um, each service member will get about $75, and it's different, so we're able to bring different types of things that women need, like the cosmetics things, and it's, it's not, it's more facial cleanser. We're able to talk with them more about the supports and services, 
talk about women's care and how to contact um, the, the VA when you get back to your state because they're still on active duty. So half of them don't know anything about it, probably should know anything about VA. So we're able to bring a one-sheeter on who to contact when you get back to your state. Um, you give them, you know, pointers with to, you know, your service, of, um, service officers, but we also list VFW, American Legion, depends on where they are and where they come back to the state. And that's been huge because many of them, while they can't, they're not, they're not DAV members or can't become DAV members, but they're getting supports and services and they will contact me and find me when they get out. I mean, so many others is what it's all about. So I want to open it up um, so you have an opportunity. I see someone's at the, the microphone here before we get to, too far down and tell me why. Hi, my name is Gail Gelch. I'm from Indiana, Chapter 17. And uh, these are the kind of women veterans that come to our chapter. I have a mom and two children that come in on Friday evening that says her husband is Peter. She said, come to the house. And she has no money and she needs somewhere to spend that night on Friday evening. And it's 8 o'clock in the evening and I can't go to the VA and I have nowhere for her to go to spend the night. And she has two and sometimes three children. And she's walking and she's just been beat up. And now where do I send her? So I think you're And this is more often than not. I'm sure. not in the neighborhood. Where do I go with her now? So and now the notion ain't going to help her. Right, so the medical centers have an IEP at interpersonal violence um, coordinators as well, but through your women veterans program manager, getting their key, you know, contact information to say, I have an emergency, you know, how can you help? And so, I mean, I would ask them, because they partner often with the community, for someone that can take them in any, at any point in time. So, I mean, it's building that, rapport with that person to say, you know, here's what I'm having, you know, people coming, what can I do, who should I call, what is a number for immediate help, and they should be able to find someone that they've partnered with in the community or within VA to, to take care of that immediately. And also, after hours, VA emergency room is open, there is a caseworker and a social worker in the VA emergency room, so you can just go there. I'm Sandy Franks, I'm uh, from Louisiana. I happen to be one of the ambassadors for the Women's Memorial. Um, I have a women veterans group in Louisiana and I have 300 women veterans email addresses that I work with every month. I'll never see all 300, but I'm constantly pushing information out. So I told them that they are our uh, public affairs officers and so we have a business card. So every time we have a meeting, uh, if you are out and about and you meet a woman veteran in the post office or a restaurant or somewhere like that, you give her the card, it's got your name, you put your name and your telephone number on it. Um, it has our mission on the back and it invites her to the next meeting. So now she has a connection. Um, we do an annual seminar where we have about 120 to 150 women. It's done at no cost because the community supports us. Um, one of the uh, community events that we've gotten involved in uh, is we work with our rape crisis nurses that go to the emergency rooms. If a woman is brought in, has been raped, not necessarily a veteran woman, they take all of her clothing and they send her home in a hospital gown. So we have purchased underclothing, sports bras, t-shirts, um, jogging pants, flip-flops, so they can at least leave the hospital in clothing instead of something in paper. Uh, we also partner uh, with Nature Heart Out Street Court, which is the area that we are in. We've painted three houses for uh, disabled veterans. Uh, we sponsor homeless families at Christmas time. We partner with an American Legion and Post, and we provide them with gifts for their kids, gifts for them, and enough food to take them from Christmas to the New Year. And one of the ladies came back to us last year and she said, my kids were so excited to have pancakes on Christmas morning. And the other thing that you do is every so often you let those ladies sing their service songs. Because we do that at our, at our seminars 
And we did it on a Friday night, and I thought they were about, all going to boot me out the door and go, no, we're not doing this. Well, I gave them the word so they, they could have some assistance. One lady came to me the morning after. Uh, she was teary-eyed, an older lady. Um, and the oldest lady that we have at our conference is 83. So she came to me with a little teary-eyed, and she said, if I don't learn anything else out of this conference, thank you so much for letting me sing my service song last night because I haven't sung it in 20 years. And it just was, just little things like that that just make your heart so happy that you have to look at those women and what is it that they need. You know, get their feedback to you. Not what you think they need. You get them to tell you what they need. And, right. and I got, I'm the conduit from them to the VA Medical Center. Right. If there's a problem, I'm the one. And the VA knows me well because I work there as their public affairs officer. Right. So those are just a little thing, a few things that we've done uh, in, right. in our little Louisiana yep. home. And, and just Thank you. having that contact with the community living center, especially our aging, you know, women veterans, there might be only one or two on the whole. You know, board, so don't forget them. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Casey Johnson. I'm the past state commander for the state of Wisconsin. And I'd like to make a comment. It certainly reflects on a lot of the women in this room the power of authority they can achieve when they join DAP. So I strongly encourage you when you bring these women into your chapters, into your department, remind them hey, you have room for growth. We have women state commanders, women past national commanders. It's an excellent opportunity for them to grow in your chapter and your department. So it's more of a membership thing, but it, it's astonishing how women can advance in the DAV and positions of authority. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Kaler from the great state of Wisconsin. Uh, chapter 19 commander and also third vice uh, state commander. Uh, my colleagues are in the room today and I just wanted to say thank you for being here and continue to raise our um, profile in society. Um, I used to be the Wisconsin Women Veteran Coordinator and when I was the Women Veteran Coordinator, I brought my not invisible to the state of Wisconsin and now we have uh, 3.0 so um, the VA photographer has been to our state three times to photograph. We have probably over 250 women now in our collection. Um, and so that was the way that we raised our profile. Um, the Milwaukee Brewers, the Milwaukee Bucks, um, we're going to be at uh, the NFL in the fall, the Green Bay Packers. Um, our display will be out. And I know a lot of people in this room may have been connected to the Not Invisible Project. But it's a great way to uh, raise the profile of women veterans. Because at a lot of these events, we um, have like uh, a few women share their stories um, about you know their experience and also being a participant in the in the uh, exhibit. Um, another thing that we've done in Wisconsin is we took the VA's pledge, the White Ribbon Pledge. And we were one of the first uh, veteran service organizations in our state to have all of our executive leadership and our commander, all the way down to um, you know rank and file DAV members who are you know said yeah we want to do this. So last year at our summer uh, convention, there was over like uh, 300 of us that took the white ribbon pledge. And we continue to um, stand strong that we're not going to tolerate any uh, sexual harassment or assault, not only at the VA, but at our chapter homes, too. Because we have zero tolerance for that crap. Because a lot of women want to come out and be part of, you know, women service organizations, but they've had bad experiences in other places. And I, you know, always say, we do not tolerate that crap, <laughs> and I even show them pictures like, look, our leadership is on board with us, and I also let them know it's just not a woman's issue, it happens to men as well, it happens everywhere, anywhere, but we want to be um, the leaders um, in the veteran service you know, community 
to stand up against sexual harassment. So That's I'm great. proud of being from our state. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. about the anti-harassment VA's policies. It's got the brochure, you just do the, uh, the QR code there. Look at the letters that went out, look at the brochure, make sure you're one of them, look at after you ask those, um, them for a brochure. To have everybody take the white ribbon, uh, take the pledge, and make sure that you, know, you talk about that issue and everyone knows what it is. The other thing, uh, the other handout we had for everyone was just a short guide. So today was just a little taste, but I really want to thank the women on our panel here today um, from the various departments. will be successful. And this is just a little guide that we put together for you. If you don't know what to do, you get appointed or somebody else just got appointed. This should just give you the very basics. And then you've heard lots of information today, so I hope you'll share that and you'll be inspired uh, to do the things that uh, some of the women here have done. So thank you for joining us for the summer.